Okay, so I'm gonna do a real quick video as a follow-up to my last video, which is on functions. This is going mostly on the properties of functions. I'm doing a few at the very beginning that more dictate what to do with the domain and the target. And then we'll move on to kind of what we can do and some of the attributes of functions later on. So I'm just gonna hop on over and take a look. So three main properties, and primarily there's two with a third attribute that is dependent on the first two. So, first one is looking at one to one. So, for a function that x maps to y, it can be one to one or also injective. This is going to be a term that is used in different areas of mathematics. For what we'll be doing, I'm going to refer to things as one to one and later on, on to. But for now, injective, surjective, these are going to be two different terminologies that you'll might see in different areas of mathematics. But I digress. So function can be one to one if the element of x1 is not equal to the element of x2, which implies that function element x1 cannot be equal to function element x2. And what that means is that every element of x is mapped to a unique element of y. So something like this, we have a, b, x, y, and z. So if we do this, a of x, and then b to y, this would be a one-to-one -one function because x is mapped uniquely, y is mapped uniquely, and nothing maps to z, which is okay. But here, we have a perfectly fine one-to-one -one function. If we did something like this, where a and b both map to x, now x1 and 2 are the same, therefore it is not 1 to 1. So, moving on, we also have onto. So, function f of x maps y is onto, or surjective, if the range of f is equal to the target y. So every element of y is mapped to so that the range equals the target. In this case, when we have something A, B, and C, X and Y. A map to X, B can map to Y, and let's just say C maps to X as well. So X and Y are both mapped to, everything in the target is mapped to, therefore our range equals our target. No big deal. So, what happens we have something like A, B, C, X, Y, and Z. We do A maps to Y, B maps to Z, and C maps to X. I know this isn't the best drawing ever, but essentially everything in the target is being mapped to, and everything is being mapped uniquely. So it's both onto and one to one. Therefore, we can say that it is a bijective function, or also bijection, or a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, in order to have a bijection, we must have a function that is one-to-one -one and also onto. Now, this is going to be a few slides going over an example of two sets regarding whether they are one-to-one, -one, onto, bijective, etc. So, it's going to have a lot of similar properties here regarding the mapping. It's not the same function because the moment that you change what things are being mapped to, it becomes a completely different function. When you change the domain and the target, it also becomes a completely different function. This is more just illustrative examples showing when things are not one-to-one, -one, when they're not onto, etc, etc. So, for this first slide, we have a function of x maps to a, with x being here, of w, x, y, z, and a being a, b, c, d, e. So, as you can see, f is not one-to-one, -one because input f, w, and input f, z, both equal c. Essentially, w and z both map to c right here. So, it's not one-to-one. -one. Still a function perfectly fine. Same exact function here. It's also not onto 
because D and E are not being mapped at all. So we know that it's not one to one, it's not onto, so it's definitely not a bijection. It's simply just a function. The three properties are not necessary for a function, but typically you can derive some attributes of the function based on those properties. In this case, it doesn't meet any of the criteria, so it's just a regular basic function. No big deal. So let's see what we can do to change this a little bit. So if instead we have W mapping to D, now we have a one-to-one -one function because A is mapped, B is mapped, C is mapped, and D is mapped, each uniquely, so it's now one-to-one. -one. Now, not onto because E is still not being mapped. So the only way to fix that is to remove E entirely. So now it is one-to-one -one and onto, therefore it is a bijection. Now, we can derive potential properties of a function strictly based on the cardinalities of the domain and the target. So if function D maps to T, since your domain maps the target, is onto, then for every element in the target, there is at least one element in the domain. And essentially what this means is the cardinality of the domain is greater than or equal to the target every single time just on a mathematical stance of what the actual property entails it must meet this criteria to be on to as for one to one every element of the domain maps to a unique element of the target therefore the domain's cardinality must be less than or equal to the target so when we have on to the cardinality is greater than or equal to the target and we have one to one the domain is less than or equal to the target so the only time we can have a bijection is when both of those properties are true. So the cardinalities of the domain and the target must be equal to each other. Now, one other thing we mentioned earlier that when we have an onto function, the target and the range must be equal to each other in size. So, we can also determine that in bijections, the domain is equal to both the target and the range's cardinality. So we have four elements in the domain of bijection. We can determine there are four elements in the range because the domain and the target's cardinalities must be the same for it to be bijection and the target and the range must be equal to be onto. That's just some things we can determine based on what properties of a function we have, and then also determine what potential properties a function have based on sizes of the sets. So there's just a few examples here. We have an onto function where the domain is greater than the target, you see the cardinality is 5 onto 4. So everything is mapped uniquely. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Everything is mapped to, not uniquely. So W is mapped, X is mapped, Y is mapped, and Z is mapped. Everything's mapped to. Everything is complete. The target equals cardinality of the range. And then conversely, we have the 1 to 1 function as the domain less than target. The domain is four, the target is five. So everything is mapped uniquely, however Z is not mapped at all. And in the moment that we have a bijection, you'll notice that we have four and four. So U, W, X, and Y are mapped, and all of them are mapped uniquely, so we have a bijection. Not too bad. Moving on, we move past the properties specifically and more into things that we can do with functions. And this one based on a very particular property. 
So the inverse of a function is obtained by exchanging the first and second entries in each pair of the function. So essentially, we know that we have ordered pairs of x, y for every element of f. Instead of having x, y, we now have y, x. But in order to have an inverse of a function, the original function must be a bijection. Reason being so is if it's not, like this example here, which is not one to one or on to, the moment we try to convert that to an inverse, you'll notice that we have nine is being mapped to two things because it wasn't one to one and eight is not being mapped to anything because it wasn't on to. In order for it to have an actual proper inverse, it must be a bijection, like so. So everything is being mapped uniquely here, and everything is being mapped in general. Then we take the inverse of it, we have a proper function. Not too bad. Now, composition of functions. This is essentially having three sets. It's two functions with only three sets because we have x maps to y, y maps to g for functions f and g. We are essentially going to be using y as a middleman to get the idea of g of f is x maps to z. So essentially we are using y as a median to get elements from x to z. Here we have the three sets. x is 1, 2, 3, y is a, b, c, and z is 7, 10, 12. Now, if we have x to y, we see we have 1 to 3 maps to 1 to a, 2 to a, 3 to b. Then we have y maps to z, with a mapping to 10, b mapping to 10, c mapping to 12. Both of these are perfectly fine functions. But then we do a composition of it, we can tell that, okay, 1 maps to a, a maps to 10, so 1 maps to 10. 2 maps to a, a maps to 10, 2 maps to 10, and then 3 maps to B, B maps to 10, therefore 3 maps to 10. So when we do the composition G of F, X mapping to Z, everything maps to 10. Not too bad there. So regarding the order of composition, it can be a little bit finicky. So if we are doing the composition regarding the order of the functions and how they're applied, the order does matter. So f of g is not the same as g of f. We have two functions here, all real numbers mapping to all real numbers, that's being positive, same thing for g. We have f of x equals x cubed, g of x equals x plus two. So when we do f of g, we end up plugging the function g of x into f of x Therefore, we are plugging in the x plus 2 part into x cubed, giving us x plus 2 cubed. Meanwhile, when we do g of f, we are plugging function f into function g. Therefore, we are taking x cubed, plugging that into x plus 2, gives us a yield of x cubed plus 2. So, order of how the actual composed functions are done does matter. However, when we start composing more than one, or more than two actually, the order in which we solve it doesn't matter. So if we even look here, we have f of g of h. We could do f of g first, and then do of h afterwards, or we could do g of h and have plug that into f later. At the end of the day, we are still plugging h into g into f. So our result will not change because sometimes it might be easier to do this approach and sometimes it might be easier to do this approach. Not too bad. And then finally we get to the identity function. So identity function always maps set onto itself and maps every element onto itself. So essentially, identity function A is A mapping to A. It's defined as 
infinity function a equals a for all elements a and it's fairly silly but one very easy way to get an identity function is to have bijection so here we have sets x and y of 1 2 3 y of rst and we have some bijective function x magnet y well if we compose the inverse then we end up with x mapping to x using a target as a median during the composition and we end up with one mapping to one two mapping to two three mapping to three so if we ever compose a bijections inverse we can guarantee that we have an identity function same thing here if we change the order and have y maps to x and then x maps to y where we have the inverse being composed with the original function then x now becomes the median and we have r maps to r s maps to s t maps to t so all in all it's not too bad functions are pretty straightforward they have a lot of utilities and again it's mostly an extension on sets and understanding the different combinations we can do whether it be cross product which is how we got the functions to begin with and basically what we can do when we combine a bunch of elements a bunch of different types of logic and understanding the relations and a lot of other stuff so again i hope you learned something hopefully functions isn't too bad and hopefully i'll see you in the next video so take care